know there's no work there, right? And the, the, my handness in front of my face and my recognition is not a mode of knowing, it's, it's prior to knowing. And so I think overcoming it is well, exactly right. And, and the thing that Poteet, I heard him say to me that I've repeated more often than ever, is again the way he kind of undermined the Cartesian death hypothesis. And he said, in the midst of all, you know, and you probably all heard him say this as well, but you know, in the midst of all the doubting, I'm doubting, you know, I what I know is I'm doubting, he said, but in the midst of all that doubting, he never once denied the French language that he learned at his mother's mm -hmm. knee. <laughs> and I've always kind of thought that was kind of um, that uh, that captured a way I've tried to transmit to students the fundamental, deep, untractable problem of Descartes' whole project. You know, and that's, there are many ways you can try to, yeah, to encapsulate I, it, but I, I thought I that really, was part of it. I really find so much help in, in Polanyi's dialectical distinction between subsidiary and focal awareness. I think that's his greatest contribution. And I understand, uh, that I, I read Wittgenstein's critique of Descartes in just that way. I mean, what I, what I think he was trying to say is, you know, you can only know those things which you could conceivably doubt, but you don't in fact doubt. Yeah. And, and for Descartes, you can only know what those things are that are indubitable in principle. So he ends up with saying things like, by the way, I think I might uh, see if you want to take a pool here put some money on this, I, I suspect my students would say, what are you talking about? I can't know that I'm in pain. Of course I can. I bet you think so too. Mm -hmm. Do you? Good. <laughs> <laughs> he says it on the You're trying to suck his back into it. And we resist. <laughs> there, there's one, uh, there's one um, section in Non-Certainty where Wittgenstein says, my life consists in being content to accept certain things. Yes. That, for me, that, that sums it up. It's within, the, the, this within notion of accepting content is so important. Mm -hmm. Forms of life. And <clears throat> An observation and a question. Uh, the observation is I, you might have had to learn to see sunsets. I just was looking into a book from the early 50s in, in literary criticism in which the claim is made that for centuries people did not think mountains were beautiful. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and my initial reaction is this just simply can't be. Uh, but, it, but it was documented. We had, we've learned to think mountains are so, um, so that's just a a they, question they, about they, how they, much they had a problem about, and they solved it. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> nicely done. Uh, I'm convincing that nicely done. And, uh, <laughs> um, the, the question um, for those of you who stayed in contact with Tony, and I was thinking about this in our earlier discussion this morning, is I wonder. How much did he come under the influence of Eastern Christianity when he was in Greece? Because some of this sounds, uh, I mean, to think about him as a Greek Christian rather than a Latin Christian mm -hmm. is really interesting. Or a North Carolina Christian. Yeah. There's a big presence of Eastern Orthodox Christianity at Duke in when I was there, that it was sort of like sweeping people away, and amazing people uh, in the religion department. And I don't know to what extent that impinged on Petit, but I do remember that. I remember how excited <laughs> Doug, Doug Adams was about it. I, I just, br a brief comment in relationship to that. Uh, in in ans to, to answer that question, the evidence of the letters that Petit wrote from Greece have some bearing on that and it would be worthwhile paying more attention to than I had paid attention to. But as I recall, uh, though he, that was part of what he took in, in Greece, at least what could be seen, but he did not actively seek to enter into that, to my understanding. Okay. Uh, he was not drawn into it in terms of much of reading except in terms of 
reading some of the poets and, and literary, or, or rather cultural, people who describe sort of Greek culture and Greek cultural experience in the present. Uh, and he was quite impressed with certain, a number of authors in that regard and their take on, mm -hmm. on orthodoxy, but it wasn't mm -hmm. sort of then occasion to go into. What about icons? That seems like an obvious attractor. Mm -hmm. he, he talked about a little bit, but not in great length. Central to Greek orthodoxy is the notion of theosis, that is to say divinization. God became what man is, that man might become what God is. Um, and that fits with what I was talking about, the real presence in me, in you, the sacramental sense of God being present in the world and in this sculpted horse um, and in the natural world. So I don't know, I don't know whether he was reading anything that talked about theosis, but I know Greeks talk about it when you're there. But for being me, on the tour. For me, spirit is is the is the name of the game. And and spirit finds no better uh, uh, expression than in our conversation. This, this is one of the things I, I uh, object to with Wittgenstein, that he really um, does not give the full weight that he should have to the informal nature of conversation. And, and it was Rush Rees who, who really criticized him for that, and I think rightly. But if you, if, if you want to know about the informality and the spirit of the human, then it was right there in, in Bill's living room. As we talked and as we spoke and as we struggled together, that was um, that was the exemplification of the incarnation. I, I agree, but also looking at the sunset doesn't involve words. I'm not saying it, we're not linguistic beings who well, are experiencing well, the sunset. Let me suggest that it involves the following words, at least, sunset. <laughs> Not necessarily. Ah, I, 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 take my, yes. I take my dog out. I don't know that when he looks off. What I'm saying is they're not a linguistic experience. Well, some chimpanzee also, groups have been observed yeah. in awe uh, watching sunsets for a half hour, an hour. Sure. What, what has been observed? Chimpanzees. That's right, I've seen Is that hyphenated? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, chimpanzees are not hyphenated. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about sunset. <laughs> <laughs> but can we think without language? That's, is it possible to think without language? To look at the sunset. And oh, I can tell you something about that. I could just jump in. Uh, there's a fellow who spent 30 years giving people uh, pagers, and at random, the pager goes off, and they jot down exactly what's in the content of their minds. And over the the decades, what he found was that usually the, they are thinking without language at that, you know, at any given time. Thank you. That's the overwhelmed. Overwhelming is preponderance is that they're thinking <laughs> without language. Yeah. Well, well um, for instance, to think without language is to is to suggest the possibility that sh that non-human animals can can think in a rudimentary way. Or not? Or I mean, well, that's or maybe not. That's so no doubt about that. Oh, right. In that case, there is thinking without language. Of course. Yeah. 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 But 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 yeah. I mean. This thinking there becomes simply being conscious. Is that what thinking means? Yeah. No. Solving, no. Problem. No. Solving problems. Mm -hmm. Making real. Mm -hmm. They, they, they give animals problems, and some animals are better. Yeah, better yeah I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You hang some bananas just out of the reach of the chimpanzee, put a stick in the corner, and they will probably knock it down. But I'm not sure that that's that 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 uh, uh, the chimpanzee would be uh, quite aware of what it was doing. Well, one of the constants of science is that as, as the studies come out, month by month, one of the consistent uh, findings is that animals are smarter than we thought they were last month. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, and, and, and I, hear, I hear these stories all the time, like this is one of my favorite ones, like in, in, during the depression in New York City, things were really bad. They ate rats. How bad, How were, bad they? were they? They were so bad. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were so bad that roaches were crawling up the legs of the tables and eating the food out of the, off the plates in the restaurants. But the restaurant people solved that problem. They put the legs of the tables 
in buckets of water. <laughs> the roaches crawled up the wall onto the ceiling and dropped into the table. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I have no problem with that. <laughs> they had a problem with yeah. solving, right? <laughs> okay, uh, Gus has had his hand up. Uh, could I? Oh, go ahead. Well, go ahead. We sort of passed beyond that, but, but well, I, I was just kind of, I had the specific uh, reference back on Diane's question and what Bill was talking about in those letters because when Bill uh, was processing his Orphic dismemberment, which he does in those letters more than anything we get in publication, uh, he refers to. Uh, specifically to Philip Sherrod, somebody yeah. mentioned, uh, and Sherrod and Kelly, uh, Greek East and Latin West, Six Poets in Modern Greece, and talks about seeing at work a sensibility deeper than the surface struggles of Latin Greek Christianity. So it wasn't uh, that he became, uh, and he recognizes that Sherrod is a devout Greek Orthodox, but it's not that he participated in that tradition, but he was he was uh, drawing from that and processing his. Yeah. Yeah. I hate that word, by the way. Sorry, processing yeah. or tradition? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Oh, back here. Well, uh, a quick question here, and that is, uh, during the last couple of years of Longy's life, he felt a lot of frustration that he had more to say, but, you know, couldn't say it. You always have more to say. You always have more to say. You're right. Uh, was there any sense uh, that Bonnie felt that he wanted to say more, uh, that he hadn't got said what he wanted to say? He That he what? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Did he have projects on the list that he hadn't gotten to? I haven't seen the process. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have an answer. Ron, I wanted to ask one thing about the force of your argument, where your argument is going. Okay. And one interpretation of your paper is that Poteet in his own thinking, actually started with ontology, but didn't recognize it in some of his earlier writings. And that he finally came to realize that ontology was more fundamental than epistemology. Yeah, I, I, think, I think as he, uh, I wouldn't doubt that his time in the Boston department at Chapel Hill screwed him up. <laughs> like a real dude. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm a product of that department. I, I know. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that Ron got his degree from the philosophy department at UNC. So. Oh, sure. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, th that, th there is, there is a rampant epistemic obsession in philosophy. It's, uh, my, I left out a whole section here about Maynard Adams, who, who was a moral realist and who was really upset by the fact that we were drifting into subjectivism and relativism and so on, and he wanted to correct that. He thought the only way you could correct it was via epistem epistemology. That is, we have to have, we ha what we have to do which is very similar, I think, to some readings of Polanyi. What we have to do is expand our, our, our sensory modalities, our, expand our, our epistemic modes of encounter, as he used to call them, so that now we can, we can rely on feelings and emotions and intuitions at, rather than just simply sensory perception. And once you do that, then you will see that there, there are things corresponding to sensory perception in uh, emotional perception that is value objects as opposed to physical objects and but but the whole thing is still inside of that yeah. we, we can't save uh, uh, we can't save morality unless we find some objective uh, uh, truth makers okay. I want to follow up on that because there's, there's another reading or another thing that I hear you saying in, in your paper where it is not so much sort of a, a biographical interpretation of the path that Poteet took, 
people had a prescription for how we ought to start thinking. Well, you know, I, I, I just, uh, I, I, I'm too much of a Wittgensteinian to give you more than a description. Uh, and to, to start saying I'm doing prescriptions is uh, carrying me beyond what I would Take courage. Doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be self-deceived. <laughs> <laughs> the heart is deceitful above all things. <laughs> I just all wanted, description is prescription. There are several people that, that want to say, I just want to stick in a brief word. It se seems to me, but in terms of your project and what I asked you in this paper, in terms of this paper, take a look at what folks want as philosopher and and you've gone more than that. I don't mean to say just that, but but you have at least done that. Yeah. And and it it seems to be suggesting not only that that uh, this is where where Poteet ended up, but but in important respects it represents uh, where Poteet ended up is to some extent a, a criticism of the whole preoccupation of with epistemology. Yes. Okay. And you say dethroning epistemology, not just dethroning epistemology for Poteet. It's dethroning epistemology. You see his arguments as effectively dethroning epistemology within the modern philosophical tradition if he were only yeah. rightly understood and appropriated. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, this, this is a, uh, something of a latent prescription with regard to this. This is a, a much more fruitful direction for philosophy to move in. But it also, uh, in important respects, reconceives uh, what it is to be a philosopher, yeah. because for the most part in the modern period, to be a philosopher is to be an epistemologist. Yeah. Right? Well, you know, it's and, and Adams himself, critis his criticisms of Poti are on the line, lines of what you just alluded to. Absolutely. So. I know. Uh, and, and you know, it, it, I, I cry almost every night before I go to bed about the fact that. Um, Ordinary language philosophy is slipping away from us, mm. and and I, I I listen to the kinds of things graduate students are coming out of philosophy departments with, and uh, you know, Kripke is has 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 triumphed over Wittgenstein, and meaning has mm. triumphed over use, and though there are a couple of uh, of nice signs, and that is. There are some books coming out now about the resurgence of ordinary language philosophy, and, and that's the direction. I, I mean, ordinary language philosophy is is not going to just do epistemology and metaphysics. It's going to it's going to pay attention to the ordinary, mm -hmm. and that's what I think Bill was very acutely sensitive to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There are th at least three, maybe four hands. Here, 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 and here. <laughs> is that four, a, five, is maybe. That a I, I wanted to get Milton up because he's behind you and had his hand up all the time. How do you know? Well, this, this is just a quick comment. Uh, Canadian, there are a lot of Canadian philosophers who are interested in Merleau Ponty. And uh, there, there have been uh, anthologies put together of essays by these people on Merleau Ponty. And, I'm sorry, Merleau Ponty and Buddhism. Oh. And uh, one of the points that many of them make is that Merrill Punt, he's great, but he, uh, I'm using my Southern Baptist terminology here, uh, he has no plan of salvation. His notion of salvation is absent from Merrill Punt. It seems to me we're verging on what could be called salvation here. What did Maynard Adams think we needed to do to get out of the mess that we're in? And maybe what did Pope Deep think we should do to get out of the mess that we're in? So it just might be a way of focusing the discussion at some point. Yeah. Maybe uh, one, one of my favorite people, Simone Bay, uh, said, here's what we need to do. Pay attention. Just pay attention. And uh, philosophers don't do that. And by the way, Merleau-Ponty has virtually no standing at the APA. For sure. Yeah, no. Okay, first here. Uh, actually, just had a quick question. Could Poti have any of you read E. A. Burke's The Metaphysical Foundations of Modern Science? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Could you say more why you're uh, asking that question? Oh, well, just kind of like okay. Remember, Burke's argument is essentially sort of like the obsession with epistemology gets sort of generated by a particular sort of implicit ontology. Yes. Yeah. No. 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 Not quite. <laughs> Close. Yeah. His problem was his narrow. Uh, Epistemology. He he was criticizing the narrow epistemology, oh, yeah, yeah, sensory yeah. perception, and its corresponding uh, truncated ontology. Yeah. 
No, no way to put it yet. Um, Charles Taylor wrote an essay, Overcoming Epistemology, in which he said the, the first thing that means is overcoming foundationalism. So how would you respond to someone who said, <coughs> it looks like you're returning Bill to a kind of foundationalism, an ontology that will provide a ground for everything else? Well, I just, I just say, look, I, I, I take Bill to be, you know, uh, in agreement with Wittgenstein about the groundlessness of our ordinary language. And the fact is, you know, we don't do this because it fits something. This is just what we do. Could we do something else? I suppose so. Could we di be different kinds of people? I suppose. A uh, person, being, I suppose so. We just aren't. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're sort of, no, well, let's find out why. Well, there's there's no, nothing to go to, and I think uh, Bill might agree with that. Isn't recovering the ground, though, something about foundationalism? <laughs> I think not yet. David, oh, yeah. David first. Um, I'm trying to make sense of your insistence on the hyphen, uh, on uh, re retaining some kind of mind-body dualism. And I'm wondering if what's going on is some distinction between physiological body, the body as objective, third person, uh, versus, to use Merleau-Ponty, uh, the body as lived, experiential, phenomenal, phenomenological, which for me always involves spirit. I just, I just want to avoid panpsychism. I, I just don't want. I, I, I mean, I've been close, too close to Disney World for too long. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't, I just don't cotton to the idea that muscles make assumptions. I told Bill that. And he said? Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In terms of, you know, whether we were trying to recover foundationalism, I mean, I remember in conversation with Bill reading Wittgenstein, and of course the whole thing about there's a bunch of birds sitting on a wire, and somebody says, well, why are the birds sitting on the wire? And Wittgenstein says, they just have to sit somewhere, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was just, you know, it was just there's some questions you don't need to ask, and you need to get yourself out of asking those questions which you've been shaped by epistemological preoccupations to asking, and just Stop asking them and accept it. <laughs> you know, you're being in the if, if, you, if you haven't done this, I, yeah. really, I really recommend that you try it. What? If you're still teaching. Teach the investigations. It is amazing what impact that will, if you do it right, mm -hmm. that will have on the students. They are, they, they will really. Or if you don't have time on certainty, it's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, he wrote a, uh, a handout, I don't know if this got into the, uh, into the archives, on not being, uh, on why foundationalism and anti-foundationalism were both sort of problematic, because I think it's spun <coughs> out of the same set of assumptions you bring to it. Exactly. But, yeah. Wally, is that in the archive? Do you remember? I just want to say that... Uh, do, do, do you hear a question? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Yeah, oh, I just was, but there is a handout that Petit wrote on foundationalism and anti-foundationalism, and while he's sort of not, I don't know if that made oh. it into the... Yeah, uh, yeah. Does anyone think, recall giving me that? I say the realism, anti-realism, yeah, yeah. he, he's going to bypass those. Yeah. Yeah. I don't recall reading it, uh, but there was so much to read that uh, I could well have forgotten. If any of you sent it to me, then... Could you send that, or you, or are you looking yeah, at it? Yeah, it would be to put it on the website now that you've got this. It ought to be. I would, like to, I would like to get it and send it in. Yeah, the whole thing should be on the website. Yeah. Can I ask you yeah. a question or make a point? Uh, I think a lot of us have uh, experienced uh, uh, Polanyi and Poti through kind of an aha experience. A what experience? Aha. Uh Aha -huh. uh -huh. oh. experience. And That's laughable. It's for myself. <laughs> it's not so much uh, it's really it's not so much relating to previous scholarship. In fact, I remember the first philosophy course I had the first semester as an undergraduate, I I realized that what the professor was saying was, Oh yeah, this is the way I have reflected. This is the way things have come to some closure. 
And I continued to have, you know, there were these, there was this jump in the aha experience with Polanyi, who put it so well in terms of the tacit and the focal. And uh, somehow, I have found in the philosophy departments that I've become acquainted with, very little reflection of that sort, uh, even at an advanced stage, maybe even less so. There's a curiosity to some extent, but then in my own uh, university, uh, periodically I'd be uh, invited to come from the political philosophy <coughs> arena in which I operated to the philosophy department and try to explain to them the difference between my approach and theirs. And maybe it was uh, a lack of articulateness on my behalf, but I found it was frustrating to speak to philosophers who were thoroughly ensconced in a positivistic, analytic, linguistic kind of tradition. And, and, and you know, most of them don't speak to each other <laughs> either. Yeah. So I, I mean, at, at these big research institutions. As Harry Hopper said of the Harvard is there. Lovers of wisdom and haters of each other. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think of uh, philosophy departments as big research universities as individual entrepreneurs in search of a parking space. Yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate this paper because I think yeah. it was a fitting concluding paper yeah. for this yeah. conference. Yeah. Yeah. To, say, to, re to remind ourselves that Bill is about being yes. Bill. Yeah. And, and us being that. ourselves. They'll put it as last, so. Yeah. <laughs>